Well, as promised, Electricity Minister Dr. Dr. Josiencio Ramachopa intends to hit the ground running by meeting all the role players to find a lasting solution to the country's electricity crisis. Power Utility ESCOM has been implementing the worst rolling blackouts in South Africa on record, leaving households in the dark, disrupting manufacturing and hurting businesses of all sizes. SABC News senior political reporter Samkele Maseko speaks now to the new Minister of Electricity. Indeed, Iman, South Africans are eagerly waiting on what Dr. Jose Enzo Oramahupa will be doing in the office of the presidency responsible for electricity. South Africa is grappling with an energy crisis when Andre Derater took over as the group chief executive officer of ESCOM about three years ago. The power utility on the grid had a 66.6 .6 energy availability within the grid EAF. And when he left office, South Africa and ESCOM was sitting at 56.2% of energy availability. Mr. Dr. Jose Nzora Mokhukba, a huge task at hand, resolving South Africa's energy crisis. Are you up to the task? What is the foremost, most important issue in resolving this energy crisis, which is affecting the economy and job creation, our economy in this GDP quarter announcements results contracted in this economic quarter? No, thank you very much, Sam Kelo, and the, for the invitation and uh, uh, good evening to, to the viewers. You are absolutely correct. I think uh, energy is the, the heartbeat of uh, any economy. The South African Reserve Bank did indicate that uh, uh, load shedding is responsible for 2.1 percentage point contraction in uh, quarterly GDP. And you are right that uh, uh, the GDP is now contracted by 1.3%. And there's a direct correlation between uh, uh, the proliferation or the escalation of uh, load shedding and the contraction of, uh, of GDP. We also know that uh, it's got a direct implication on the lived experiences of uh, ordinary people. So the farmers are battling to irrigate uh, because of load shedding. And that uh, is likely going to, over a period of time, sustained period of time, could have an adverse impact on the food security and that will make the price of food on the aisles to go up because uh, there's uh, very little supply uh, if demand remains the same and the people will be disproportionately affected are likely going to be to be the poor we also know that uh, some of the major hospitals are unable to perform much needed surgery to save lives uh, so and that's why uh, the Minister of Health has been making the point that uh, some of these uh, health facilities should be exempted from uh, load shedding. The president does make the point to the extent that is technically feasible, and I can expand on that later. And then we also know that uh, small businesses have gone under. Uh, when small business go under, people lose their jobs. When people lose jobs, it means that as I speak to you, there are many families that uh, are going hungry. So it's a direct relation to to, uh, to load the uh, load shedding. Uh, and we, we know that also big businesses have to run generators at big cost and they have to pass on the, uh, that to the end consumer and that has got uh, a, an effect or effect, I'm sorry, on inflation. Major intersections are not working, so the inefficiency of the, of the network, mobility is constrained. And in some instances, you find that uh, the homeless, if you like, vagrants, for lack of better way, they take over intersections. They are really trying to um, uh, make good of, uh, of, uh, of the country just to uh, provide relief to motorists. That can uh, result in accident and in some instances might result into fatality. So I'm just saying that load shedding is a major problem that requires attention. And I guess that that's the rationale that the president uh, applied when he decided that we need uh, someone who has the executive authority who will have the singular focus on resolving load shedding. And to your point, yes, it's a daunting task. I mean, it will be a height of folly for me to sit here and suggest to South Africans that it's going to be very easy. But I am confident that with the work that we have been doing, even before this assignment in my my, my previous, uh, my immediate past life on uh, investment and infrastructure, invariably we're dealing with a pipeline of projects that come from private sector and some of the projects that are sitting with ESCOM, I'll expand on that. We know that the opportunities are there. Uh, also about strengthening the grid, evacuating the electrons, uh, uh, creating incentive on the demand side for rooftop solar, 
for, for households and including uh, uh, big retailers, property developers, and creating um, feed-in uh, capacity, additional incentive for people to feed in. Yes, it's going to be difficult, but I'm more than confident about our ability, and I'll explain what I mean by our ability as we continue. Dr. Ramakop, you have just diagnosed the problem which your government, your political party, has diagnosed since time in memorial. What are the immediate steps with this new ministry that has been created that are you going to be undertaking in the immediate to resolve the crisis? Give us a, a five-point plan that you have in place that when you leave here, this is what you are going to do. Yeah, so there's the energy action plan that the president has unveiled. And by coincidence, it also has got five pillars. Uh, so the first one is uh, on the what you call the generation side. So if I to use an illustration, so this is the meter, this side is consumption, and this side is how you receive uh, your, your energy. So anything that sits on this side is about demand, what you need to meet your daily need, to boil water, to take a shower, uh, to, uh, to, to run a, a, a pool pump, and so on and so forth. So this is your demand to switch on the light. But this demand feeds on the supply. Uh, and the supply side, there are multiple players. The dominant player on the side of the meter is, uh, is ESCOM. So we know that ESCOM at any given time now can guarantee about 26,000 megawatts. And we know that anything between four to 6,000 of those megawatts are at the risk of unplanned, unplanned uh, maintenance. We also know that uh, a scenario is going to play itself out going into winter. Uh, peak demand is going to be about 32,000 megawatts. So if you like this, we must find 6,000 megawatts to resolve this problem. So this 6,000 megawatts means we either increase the generation capacity to get the 6,000 megawatts or you reduce this demand because these are the people who are consuming. It's industries, households, it's farmers, it's hospitals, it's schools. So you reduce their demand without undermining their ability to meet their daily needs, without undermining commerce uh, uh, ambition or objective of uh, maximizing profit. Or the third option, which is my preferred option, you do both. You increase uh, uh, generation and then you reduce demand. So what are those plans? In the short term, this is what you can do. We know on the generation side, when you open the show, you say that the energy availability factor has, uh, has gone down. So essentially, you have bought a car. The car can reach a speed of 100 kilometers per hour so that you are able to get quicker to your destination. But this car, because it's so old and it has not been maintained, uh, it uh, gets to about uh, 50 kilometers an hour. So you need to replace some components to ensure that it gets to uh, as close as possible to 100 kilometers an hour. So if you have a BMW, you can't go and get parts for Toyota. You go to the original equipment manufacturer. But you must also get uh, an experienced mechanic who knows this car to be able to get the right component. And that's why we are saying we are going to focus on the 81 units in the in ESCOM. And by the way, this we do working with the Minister Godan as the shareholder, the accounting um, uh, uh, authority, that's the board and the executive authority, that is the CEO of, uh, of the company. So the energy availability factor, two things must happen there, some girl. The first one, you must return those units that are out of operation. So the car is by the side of the road, you fix it and then it gets into operation. The second one is to to, to ensure that there's increased efficiency on those that are running. So this car is still on the road, but it's at 40 kilometers an hour. We want to ramp it up to 70 kilometers an hour. That intervention, that responsibility sits with, uh, with the people at ESCO. Because uh, the point must be made, the people who are going to resolve uh, an improvement in the efficiency or energy availability factor is the engineers at ESCOM. They must be affirmed for that purpose and to the extent that they require any form of assistance will resolve will resolve that. So if they come back in this uh, plant and say I need to replace a turbine, I need to replace that instrumentation, but I have to go through the PFMA, it's taking forever and we can confirm that indeed the problem is the PFMA. Then you invoke the provision, provisions of the Disaster Management Act. So those must not be abused. You is a is a is a intervention of last resort. So when there's a problem, you don't invoke the provision. So that's and we we have computed in terms of the energy action plan that you can get five megawatts, uh, five thousand megawatts. The next one, 
uh, is to ensure that there's additional generation outside the ESCOM fleet. Because what National Treasury has done with the fiscal relief to ESCOM in relation to its debt, it says once we free up that capacity for additional investment, you are going to either repurpose the existing plant or spend it on, on, the, on the existing uh, um, uh, repurposing of, uh, of the plant or improving the energy availability effect. That's when now we go to the renewable energy um, uh, 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 developers. Some of them we know have gone through about six uh, bit windows of, of that. Uh, some of these um, energy, I mean, the, 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 the projects are up and running, but you can evacuate if you like. You can't bring the, the energy on stream because it's stranded. Remember how the grid is organized in this country. Is that is in the in the Mpumalanga? Why is it in Mpumalanga? We're relying on fossil fuels. The biggest deposits of coal of good quality is there in Mpumalanga. So it's closer to source, closer to the mine conveyor belt, so that you undermine the cost of logistics and doing business. And we're able to lift generation. On the demand side, is opportunities around rooftop solar solution. Co combined with the uh, battery storage and also the inverters so that uh, you on this side of the meter i rely my dependence on what gets to be supplied i generate for myself for big industry what they call embedded generation rooftop solar is embedded generation on a micro scale so big mining houses this side of the meter they are able to generate uh, their own electricity we know they're energy hungry so in a in a in a in a in a, in a short way that's how we're going to make those intervention they appear to be very simple but they are going to be very complex once we enter the space but the point i want to be to make and convey to the south african public is that it's not just doable we're going to do it we're going to reduce both the regularity and intensity of load shedding as directed by the president and working with the people and the players in the energy ecosystem in this country Minister, when you look at the repurposing of these uh, coal power stations, particularly those ones that have been decommissioned, are you in any way looking at the social campaign to repurpose these power stations in the immediate from, from use, to using gas and in going on to liquid nitrogen as well, which is one of the areas which the President has said that in repurposing these coal power stations in Mpumalanga in order to reskill the ESCOM workforce as well to create employment in that area, how are you going to be going about repurposing? Purposing these coal decommissioned power stations. Yes, and, and, and remember some of the, the things I'm saying here, it's, uh, it's not my own creation. So they reside in the, uh, the integrated resource plan and some of the articulation by, by, by government. So why gas? Gas is important because it's what we call base load. So what is base load? Is the minimum amount of energy that must be available at any given time. Uh, the issues with regards to uh, to solar uh, is that it's intermittent. You are going to get it when the sun is up, and then uh, at night you are unlikely going to. You are not going to get that. And if you have, you don't have battery storage, then you can't rely on on batteries. That's why the combination of solar and battery does enhance the possibility of. Uh, providing relatively what could be considered base load and you maintain the integrity of the system so that there's no significant uh, oscillations in the ratios and, and the system is, uh, is well protected. And gas is important because we have existing pipelines, for an example, from Mozambique. Uh, that, uh, if you like, can have tributaries that goes to uh, to this uh, power station that uh, we have decommissioned to ensure that uh, we we run our turbines on gas and we are able to guarantee a base load. And uh, as, if you look at the integrated resource plan, I think coal is 44 percent, um, gas and diesel is about uh, 15 percent, and nuclear is 2.5 percent PV10 and the uh, wind uh, is about uh, 15 percent then there's hydro um, uh, 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 concentrated solar power those ones in the totality of uh, if you like the share of the integrated resource plan are insignificant but still uh, important uh, for purposes of uh, showing that we are technology agnostic and we're looking at other possibilities going into the future so the long and short of my answer is that yes gas is an important part of the mix and that comes from the integrated resource plan and of course, to evacuate that energy, you already have existing infrastructure in the form of the grid, so you can get it to where you want to get it to without significant investment in the grid capacity. Brings me to my next question, Minister, particularly on the issue of diesel. ESCOM in the past financial year burned 
14.7 billion rands through gas turbine uh, through gas turbines open cycle turbines open cycle. in the previous year when Enrique rate director took over in 2020 in 2020 rather escom burnt 7.5 billion rands for open gas circle turbines you said you would be engaging with the minister of finance trying to get money and use it to procure emergency diesel whilst the old escom fleet is being refurbished the turbines are you still looking at engaging the minister and how much are you willing to spend in a financial year looking at the black hole that ESCOM has become in burning gas turbines? Yes, so a bit of context so that we get to understand how you get there. So there's a correlation between the deterioration of the energy availability factor and the increase in the open uh, um, uh, cycle uh, that is, uh, is diesel is precisely because it wants to offset the deterioration in the energy availability factor. So your best chance of uh, undermining any significant and exponential spending on diesel is to ensure that you rectify or address the energy availability factor. And that's why that's, those solutions are to be found at the, at the plant level. And of course, I mean, if this deterioration happened for you to protect, uh, if you like, the system, if it means that you are going to bend diesel, you are likely going to burn diesel because the cost of not burning diesel can be catastrophic. So you don't want to get to higher levels of load shedding because we know that the cost of uh, unsaved uh, energy, unsaved energy, I'm sorry, to the economy is about 500 uh, billion rands uh, per annum. It's a computation that was done uh, by some of the, the, the leading firms in the country. So you've got an option uh, in the worst case scenario. Whether you burn this diesel that is two billion, three billion, and that money is huge by any measure, or you choose not to burn it, and the cost to the South African economy um, rises beyond that uh, 500 billion rand. So there's a opportunity cost. So you must do that computation. And part of us coming out of uh, to to the public, and I really cherish this opportunity extended to us, is because we get an opportunity to communicate to the public through this platform, of course, through this rigorous uh, interrogation, so that we know what is it that we are addressing. We can choose not to bend this. Uh, and then you go to higher stages of load shedding. And then the situation becomes catastrophic. And accept that, or accept that that burning of diesel is an intervention that is required to address the deterioration in the energy availability effect. And then accept that the most enduring and sustainable solution to the energy problem in this country is to address the ESCOM fleet. I mean, we know, for an example, as I speak to you now, that uh, there are six power stations that are experiencing high levels of perennial failure. And those undermine your ability. Uh, Why to, are they failing? Well, those are the questions when we go to a plant level, we have to ask. So I don't want to sit here and uh, fashion responses without having had an opportunity to engage. And I'm sure when I engage with the board, when I sit with Minister Godan, because I don't want to create an impression that government starts now to understand the electricity problem. So Minister Godan has been at the cold face. And that's why uh, some of the interactions that have happened now is with Minister Godan, Minister Mantashe, and, uh, and Minister and Minister Kodongwa. So that uh, the triumvirate, the three, the three of them, myself, put together, were able to see how best to address this situation. Of course, now we've been given the executive authority to make those interventions on the generation side, addressing the monopoly that is ESCOM, the renewable energy players on the, on the demand side, and everything across the entire value chain, the availability of uh, equipment, the availability of accredited installers to ensure that they were able to, to accelerate, if you like, this transition and stem the deterioration of uh, energy supply in this country. You raise a very important point of Minister Mantashi. During the, mine, during the Energy Africa in Daba in Cape Town this week, in fact yesterday, Minister Mantashi gave a three-point plan which is improve energy availability, power station by power station, acquire emergency energy from independent power producers, your car power ships, etc. He moves on to say, import energy from neighboring countries. Do you agree with this three point plan of Minister Kwede Mantashe, particularly knowing that he's been under attack as being perceived as a fossil fuel who's saying we can't dump 
the base load of coal, where last year alone, South Africa exported 50 million tons of coal abroad, which is the A grade of coal, where our coal powered stations in South Africa are designed to take the lowest grade of coal. Oh yes, I did make the point, and I think I've uh, elaborated on that in relation to the need to improve the energy availability factor. So that's important. It's indispensable to the resolution of the energy crisis. So I agree with Minister Mantash. And then accept that in some instances, it's going to take an inordinate amount of time to fix this, uh, uh, this power station. And in fact, I want to go a little bit lower than what, uh, more detailed than what Minister Mantash is saying. I'm saying, don't just look at the power station, but the 14 power stations, their performance, but look at the 81 units at each and every power station. So we go at level just lower than that, so that there's an appreciation that this unit is operating at this efficiency. What does it take to, to, to take it to the levels of efficiency that can contribute to the aggregate being upwards of uh, 70, 78 percent because the, the integrated resource plan makes an assumption that the energy availability factor will be 78 percent. So that to maintain the integrity of that energy, the integrated resource plan, we need to up the, the energy availability factor. So we agree. And then on the second one, that it can take that inordinate amount of time, then uh, procure emergency power so that in the short term you are able to power the, the South African economy and it's possible. I mean, there are microgrids, there are multiple solutions that they were looking at. Of course, ESCOM is leading in that. Uh, ESCOM has got the nice solution, um, uh, like a micro power station. So it's something in a small container, you put it in a less dense, uh, less energy consuming area, it can power up to 50,000 50, 50 houses, I'm sorry, five zero at the cost of two million rand. So it's just an aggregation of these uh, uh, low hanging fruits that can help us to find significant traction. And there's an appreciation that we, we, we are, are, are doing something. Of course, the scale that Minister Mantaj is talking about is what I call utility scale. You don't talk about powering 50 houses. It's something significantly more than that, upwards of, uh, of 100, uh, 100 uh, megawatts. So yes, I agree that uh, those are the interventions that uh, needs to be made to help us to ensure that we, we are able to, to accelerate, if you like, uh, the intensity and regularity of, uh, of load shedding in this country. And those uh, assertions by Minister Mantashi are consistent with the integrated resource plan. Your governing party is stuck between the left and the liberals. For instance, when you look at the president, he could not take energy. He could not take ESCOM back to the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy and created this buffer of a transition, with the, which is your ministry. When you look at South Africa's energy trajectory, particularly when you look at the Just Transition Program, the former ESCOM Group Chief Executive Officer, Andre Derreta, said the governing party wants to eat fraudulently through the Just Transition process, but also you've got a minister on the other hand who's saying we can't dump fossil fuels. Where are you more aligned to? in this most powerful ministry right now in the presidency responsible for, for electricity. Are you more inclined to coal or more inclined to renewable energy, particularly as you engage with the private sector? I saw you engaging with Business Unity South Africa today. And what are they promising and bringing to the fore? Well, uh, I am in favor of the integrated resource plan. And let me just say, say the following. So the integrated resource plan says the share of coal is going to be about 44%. The share of uh, PV about 10%, wind 15%, gas and diesel 15%, nuclear 2.5%, and then you have a uh, hydro. You have a, uh, you have um, nitrogen. Uh, gas. Uh, no, no, no. You, 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 you have a uh, concentrated mm -hmm. solar power and hydro as uh, some of uh, the complementary, um, um, if you like, technologies. So there is no conflict the way I see it. So coal is part of the mix. Solar PV is part of the mix, oh, and battery storage, I think, is about 15%. is also part of the mix. So, I mean, it depends uh, where the person is. Uh, um, I mean, everything that we do is within the parameters of uh, the integrated resource plan. And of course, in future, there's opportunities with regards to green hydrogen. And the only reason that's not part of the, the energy mix is that you must answer three questions. 
what is the demand and where is the source and what is the unit cost. And we know that there is a technology that is still maturing, but there's significant opportunities going into, into the future. I don't want to be drawn into uh, that uh, political conversation on whether there's a case or not for electricity at the ministry. I'm just transfixed on the resolution of uh, the, the, the load shedding. And I did make the point that I've already had that conversation with uh, my peers there. And there's an appreciation that there must be a singular laser focus on the resolution of this problem. And one of the things that I think I'll bring into the equation is my personal relationship with all three of them. Um, genuinely uh, honest relationship. We've built them over a period of time. Minister Godan, when I was the mayor of Tswani, he was the uh, minister of finance, significant amount of uh, interaction. Minister Mantache, when I served as the chair of the ANC in the region of Tswani, was the SG trying to come into this place, trying to, to build the organization. Minister Godongwana, more recently as the chair of the DBSA, and me running the investment and infrastructure office. So there's an appreciation that we must resolve the, any, the electricity crisis. Load shedding is the single most uh, potent danger to, if you like, the stability of this country, its interest and the future and post posterity. So it's important that uh, we put everything aside and focus on the resolution of this problem. And I'm more than confident that they'll bring their weight to bear in helping us to resolve this problem. Corruption. Mpumalanga is the heartland of South Africa's coal generation. Most of our coal power station are within that province. ESCOM loses about a billion rands a month from gangs whom sabotage, allegedly, the conveyor belts that transport coal to these power stations. How are you going to deal with those criminal networks within the power utility that not only steal and get illegal contracts through destroying these conveyor belts, but also are procuring alien, alien equipment to fix this old coal-powered fleet? The main issue, corruption at ESCO. Well, I neither have the capacity nor the mandate to address the issues of corruption. And I think that working with law enforcement agencies, uh, they must come to the party and address those. But also what, the point I want to make is uh, I can't speak of corruption in aggregate terms. I did say that uh, there are multiple power stations at the uh, ESCOM. And of course, working with Minister Godan, I'm sure he would have documented some of those experiences. I'm confident the leadership of ESCOM and the level of the board and management. And I'm sure that this corruption has got multiple manifestations. When you move from one plant to the other, manifestations across the value chain, uh, it takes different forms. So I can't sit here and say there's corruption. Because the last thing I want to do uh, is to come into the space. And when I go to the plant level, I choose uh, the, uh, the hard working the many hard-working, professional, committed patriots that are working for ESCO, they get there, there's corruption. From getting there, uh, of course, uh, with the minister, Minister Godan, reaffirm our confidence in their professionalism, reaffirm our support to them, and ask of them to continue to dedicate themselves to the resolution of this problem and indicate to us what are those problems that they are encountering. And in the course of that, all of these things will come to the surface. Of course, it will not be on the first encounter. There will be a better appreciation of what are the uh, pertinent problems, the problems that are obtaining there. But I think it's very defeatist that you enter into the space, the first statement I'm saying, these people are corrupt. The first statement I'm making is that working with the people of uh, ESCOM, the employees across uh, uh, the, 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 the entire levels of uh, ESCOM, working with the private sector, the resource mobilization fund, 100 million rands today. Big story that the private sector has made available to support our work. You know that there was a distraction by some voices to say the ministry will cost 38 million rands per annum and all of this. Business has come to the party understanding that we need significant amount of expertise and say to us what is the kind of expertise that you need here's a pool you can tap from but how we acquire those skills is going to be transparent and uh, and uh, and uh, ensuring that we are accountable to how we use this money and uh, the point i'm making is that for anyone to succeed at least this is my philosophy so i'm not suggesting that it's uh, it's universal is that for, for, for me at any position to succeed, I need to work with those who know better than me. And in that way, we'll be able to resolve this problem. And it will be a height of folly 
as an engineer having majored in hydraulic structures and uh, road construction to suggest that I'm going to build a power station. But the general philosophy, the methodology of how you deal with project management, which is key in understanding any complex technical problem, is the same across the engineering fields. So it's those uh, technicians, the electricians, the instrument specialists at ESCOM who are going to resolve those problems, will provide the necessary support, provide the necessary cover for those who are committed, be the principal advocates of whistleblowers and their protection, and agitate for those who are meant to protect them, to protect them. But the load shedding, I want to emphasize on national TV. We are going to resolve it. When are you going to resolve it? When I come back from, uh, from that engagement, highly responsible uh, just to shoot from the hip and say this date, that date, going to come back to the people of this country, having worked with Minister Godan, Minister Mantashe, uh, Minister Godongwani, and the collective of uh, cabinet and also business. The energy action plan is there. It does have short term, medium term. We are going to interrogate the modeling, come back and say this is the resources that are required. These are the provisions of the Disaster Management Act that we are going to invoke. These are additional regulation that we are going to advocate for. We have already spoken to, like, I said, industry, uh, BUSA engage business for South Africa, I engage with the telcos. They spend up to 5 billion rand just on spending on batteries. And so it's important that we are going to be engaging with the farmers. On Wednesday, I'm sitting with the leadership of Salga. And uh, municipalities are buying 50% of bulk electricity from ESCOM. They are an important player, but it's also an existential question. Some of these technologies that we are advocating for can erode their revenue base. We know that many, some municipalities uh, derive up to 60% of their revenue from electricity. So when you resolve one problem, don't create another, but it's possible to do both at the same time. So it's not a, a binary question. I'm confident that will resolve this question. Before the elections? No, but it's the timeline. Now, when if I you say don't before, resolve it before the elections, your party may accuse you of uh, failing them and them resulting in losing the election in 2024. Or oh, the one thing I'm going to do in this position is not to be expedient. We are going to be ambitious. We are going to be realistic. Some of the things I'll be saying to the general public will be unpalatable. I'm sure everyone now listening to you wants me to say on X date load shading will be done. I am saying give me an opportunity, the energy action plan will come back to you, measure us against uh, the targets we have set ourselves, how many new megawatts ad additional capacity we are bringing on board, how many megawatts on the demand side we are reducing, and on that you will be able to, to measure us. Um, I mean the one thing, lies have got short legs, so it's important, we are going to be brutally honest with regards to the state of the national grid, with regards to how far we are we are going to be very honest and I'm going to use this platform of course assuming that you'll be inviting us like you always do to share with the public and you'll be brutally uh, honest and engaging with me and we'll try and give you answers as honest as possible. Thank you very much Minister of Electricity. One man once said at Megawatt Park I'm now going to report to the country that they will never ever be load shedding again but in the past two years we've had about 200 days of load shedding. I don't know what it means, but you're not making any promises. That is the Minister of Electricity saying, let him be given an opportunity with the men and women who are the engineers, who are the instrumentationists, who are the industrialists in saving this crucial power utility, ESCOM, which has single-handedly become one of the biggest threats to the South African economy and also a big black hole in ESCOM's balance sheet. They are in financial doldrums a year year in and year out, they are declaring that they have made a loss. South Africans don't have electricity, businesses are retrenching, the economy has contracted in these latest GDP quarter numbers. But President Ramaphosa seemingly has confidence in this civil engineer in resolving this crisis at ESCOM, saying that he will require the expertise and those who've been at the power utility in resolving this particular crisis, Iman.